with every gift known to man. Waiting in the palm of your tiny hand. Given the chance to dream, a vision that your heart has already seen. Pass the torch, one to another. Carry the flame as far as you can. Pass the torch, sister to brother. The journey is yours, the journey is mine. A journey to understand. Holding on to the key. Ready to unlock your World famous athletes, astronauts, international personalities who have really made a difference in our world. You and I, we all started out exactly the same, just like that beautiful little baby that you just saw. We were born rich, rich in potential. We have deep reservoirs of talent and ability within us. You're about to embark on one of the most exciting journeys you could possibly get involved with. This program, You Were Born Rich, is the most effective personal development program in the world today. It's been designed specifically to help you realize all of your dreams, live the life that you really want to live. We're going to invite you into a live seminar so that you can experience the excitement, the high energy of actually being there. We have special guest Paul Hutsey on the program. You'll be meeting other personalities, people just like you and I, who have been involved in this program and it's made a tremendous difference in their life. Consider this, just like that baby when you and I were born, we were natural born risk takers. We had no limitations. We were free to step out and do everything we wanted to do. Now, some of the people that you are going to see interviewed have attended this seminar, some of them a number of times, most of them at least twice. The real benefit of having this seminar on the video is that you can stop the tape at any time and go back and play it over again. You see, reading and memorizing or just watching this really is not going to do you any good. You must understand and apply the ideas. Now, the exercise book, your action planner, that's in your program is vitally important. It's probably one of the most important elements in your entire Born Rich program. It's vitally important that as I suggest you get involved in an exercise, you take it and you really get involved. Stop the tape. Think of where you are and think of where you want to go and complete the exercise. Don't put it off. Literally wear this book out. Now what I'd like you to do is come with me, mentally prepare yourself as we go into a live seminar. There's a seat saved just for you. You are about to embark on the most exciting journey of your life. Bob Proctor Seminars proudly presents You Were Born Rich, the most dynamic personal development program of its kind in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, here to lead you through your journey into your own powerful potential, Mr. John Canary and Mr. Bob Proctor. Robert? How are you feeling? Wonderful! I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Robert. 
Could all the people on this side of the room just remain silent for just a moment? Let's just try this side of the room, see who wins this contest, okay? How are you feeling? <laughs> Hold on, Robert. Whoa, my turn. <laughs> now, let's see whose side you're on here, all right? How do you feel? <laughs> Sorry, old buddy. Looks like you won. <laughs> We're going to get started with Robert. All right. Well, I want to wish you a very warm welcome to our seminar here today, and we've got a special guest who is sitting at home, and we're inviting that person into our seminar, and they're going to experience everything you're going to experience. I know many of you have been through our seminars before, some of you have never been through our seminars, but I think you'll find if you keep your mind wide open, just sit back and relax, you're going to find it a pretty interesting experience. I've often mentioned that we never give anybody a brain hernia with the information we use. It's all very simple, and it's very, very effective. You know, I've spent a long time studying the subject of why we do what we do and why we don't do some of the things that we'd really like to do, and I've come to the conclusion that the two main elements in a successful, fulfilled life is motivation and education. And if we get a proper balance of motivation and education, we're going to find that we're going to be led into some very wise decisions that will inspire us into some intelligent action, and we will live a very, very fulfilled life. What I would like to suggest you do is flip to number page two in your action planner. Take your action planner and turn to page two. You know, some time ago, John Canary gave me a, a little piece of literature about getting out of the comfort zone that was written by Bob Briggs in Southern Florida. And there's some excellent information in here. Many of us are pretty comfortable in our life. We've got a reasonably good income. The mortgage is paid. There's food in the fridge. We've got a nice warm bed to sleep in. And everything seems to be floating along just fine. And you know, a person in that position could very easily think, why would I want to do anything to change this? Well, we have found that if your life is not going in one direction, it absolutely, by law, must be moving in another direction. And Riggs is talking about that here. He said, many of us have established a comfort zone in our lives. We're just coasting along, taking the line of least resistance, just getting by. Now, he said this is a very common and understandable attitude. We've all worked hard to get to where we are, and it may seem a very good place to be. The problem with this is that once we stop reaching, stretching, seeking, and risking, we actually stop growing. Now, Riggs goes on to say that the comfort zone frame of mind is settling for what we are today. That may be fine today, but without continued growth, and I believe this is the key line coming up, we are now all we are ever going to be. Now, for me, that would be a fairly disturbing thought. He went on to say, if you are in a comfort zone, beware. The danger of a comfort zone is that it doesn't hurt and it might even feel good. Many take that to mean it's a good place to be, but it's not. A comfort zone may be what is holding you back from real growth, real accomplishment, and your potentially exciting and rewarding future. Now, I've mentioned if we're not going in one direction, we must by law be going in another direction. You're either creating or you're disintegrating. Whenever we hear a person say, I like it just the way it is, we know that person is advertising their ignorance of a very basic law of life because absolutely nothing stays the way it is. Now, if you'll take a look at the top of page two, there is a, uh, a concept there by Sidney Herbert Wood, and it's the test of an educated person. I think many of us have had a, a, a false concept programmed into our mind with respect to education. We, uh, I think, have been raised to believe that education is going to school for a certain number of years and be able to correctly answer a series of questions. But, you know, many people will go to school all their life 
and be able to correctly answer the questions. But then when it comes to getting out into the marketplace and really making it happen, they just don't know how to compete. Many are withdrawn. They, uh, they don't even feel comfortable meeting or greeting a stranger. Well, Wood said the test of an educated person is, can I entertain a new idea? Now, I think you know, and I know, that if we're going to improve, we have to have a very open mind. I once heard that an open mind was being prepared to throw away some of our most cherished beliefs when a better idea comes along. Now, you'll find that the vast majority of people seems to back into the future, dragging all of their old experience with them. When they're confronted with a new idea, they ask, does it fit? If it doesn't, then they say it's wrong. Now, what we want to do is ask ourselves, would this new idea improve the quality of my life or would it get me going in the other direction? Can I entertain a new idea? Today and tomorrow, you're going to be asked to entertain many new ideas, but every one of the ideas that we're going to share with you are going to be positive, they're going to be creative, they're going to be constructive, and they'll definitely improve the quality of your life. Then we see the second one, can I entertain another person? Now, there's many people that would feel totally uncomfortable walking up to a stranger and just saying, Hi, how are you today? Pleased to meet you, Jan. Now, do you know some people, when it comes to meeting a person, their head is down, their hand is wet, they're shaking inside, their heart is pounding, and they only do it because they really have to. They would just as soon pull away from the new person. Now, that individual has not learned very much, if anything, about themselves. Because we should feel totally comfortable meeting anyone, anywhere, at any time. And then he asks, can I entertain myself? Well, you know, many people are not able to entertain themselves. I spent half my life not being able to entertain myself. I always had to be around someone else. It was always, come on, let's have a party. I absolutely hated being alone. And that was because I really didn't like myself. Now, I have found through studying the ideas that we're going to cover here over the next couple of days, we can develop into very interesting and reasoning companions. Most of the time that we live, we do spend with ourselves. And you're going to find that some of the very best conversations you ever have are going to be with yourself. I get so excited about some of mine, I talk right out loud. I draw a you know, strange look from people from time to time. But you get such great ideas going in your mind that you just can't help it. Now, here in the first paragraph, we say that this program, You Were Born Rich, is based on the premise that you have rich resources lying dormant within you. I have heard many people uh, laugh when they take a look at our program or take a look at the title of the book, Born Rich. You see, they think that means that you've been born into great wealth. Some people are, but some people are not. But everyone, without exception, has been born with tremendous resources lying within them. We've got deep reservoirs of talent and ability. And through following right rules and natural laws, we're going to find that we can draw that potential to the surface and we can bring it to bear and it will cause the manifestation of prosperity in our material world. Now, in almost all the seminars that either John or myself does, we take and we put an R here in the board. Now, what I would like to suggest you do is you let that R represent the results that you're getting in your life. Now, there's three areas that we're going to suggest that you focus on. One is happiness, one is health, and another one is material wealth. Now, when I first started to study this material, I was not happy, I was not healthy, and I definitely was not wealthy. I had a chap sit down with me, and he saw something in me that I obviously wasn't capable of seeing in myself. His name was Raymond Stanford, Raymond Douglas Stanford. In fact, I named my son after him, Raymond Douglas Proctor. And Ray looked at me and he said, Bob, let these, this here represent results that you're getting in your life. Then he asked me if I thought he was a happy person. And I said, yeah, I thought he was. He said, have you ever seen me sick? And I had to admit I hadn't. He said, have you ever seen me when I was broke? And again, I had to admit I hadn't. Well, he proceeded to tell me that he thought I was one of the most miserable people he had ever met. Well, and you know it was true. I was an unhappy human being. He said, you're always sick. Now, I didn't have a terminal illness, but I always had a headache or a cold or a backache or something. And he pointed at the area of money. He said, you're always broke. 
He said, you're forever trying to hit somebody up for a couple of dollars for gas. Now, if I was to put this in proper perspective for you, I was earning $4,000 a year at the time, and I owed six. So do you see, I wasn't really interested in being happy or healthy at the time. I figured if I could just get this money problem straightened out, everything was going to be great. He proceeded to tell me that there were certain laws governing happiness, and if you follow them, you can just keep getting happier and happier. That sounded a little foreign to me, but that was his opinion. And he pointed out that you and I have an ingenious system built within us to keep our body in excellent working order. And then when he talked about the area of money, he said, you know, he said there's exact laws governing wealth. And he pointed out, he said, this stuff cannot talk, but it can hear. And he said, if you call it, it'll come. Well, I can assure you, I was ready to yell at the top of my lungs. I mean, if there was anything I wanted, it was some money. I figured it would take the heat off for a little while. Ray suggested that I go out and buy this book. It's Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich. And you know, he said there's a secret in this book. And he said, if you can find the secret in the book, you can have anything you seriously want. Now you take a person that's unhappy, not very healthy, is in debt, you'd have a difficult time accepting that. I was 26 and I just couldn't accept the idea. But as Ray said, your way's not working, why don't you try his? And that's what I'd like to suggest to you today. If you're not getting the results you want, your way obviously isn't working, why don't you try ours? Now, I often mention that John and I have got license to brag about every idea we use because none of them are ours. We don't claim uh, that we've originated these ideas. In fact, we openly admit we haven't. We've just gathered them from books here and seminars there and great teachers all over the world. And what we've done is put them together in an organized, coherent manner. So. If your way is not giving you the results you want, I would suggest that you take a real serious look at these ideas. Now, I looked for the secret and I couldn't find it, but I found in one place here, he said a peculiar thing about this secret is that those who once acquire it and use it find themselves literally swept onto success with but little effort and they never again submit to failure. What a marvelous promise. He said, if you doubt this, study the names of those who have used it wherever they've been mentioned. Check their records for yourself and you'll be convinced. Now he lists upwards of a hundred names here. He's got Henry Ford, William Wrigley, James J. Hill, George Eastman, Theodore Roosevelt. He goes on here, uh, John D. Rockefeller, Thomas Edison, Luther Burbank, Woodrow Wilson, how could I relate to any of those people? I couldn't relate to them. But you see, in that first part, he said, check their names or check their records wherever they've been mentioned. So I did that. And I got out books on Edison and I got books on Rockefeller and I got books on Woodrow Wilson and all the great people that he had mentioned here. And you know what I found? I found they were no different than you. They were no different than me. Many of them had very little formal education, which made me feel fairly comfortable because I didn't either. Many of them had very, very rough roads to start on. But I found out we were essentially all the same. Do you know what was different? The results they were getting. And as I studied on here further, in his chapter on persistence, and, and he mentions that persistence to the quality or to the character of the human being is like what carbon is to steel. He said the only thing that he could find in Edison or Ford that he never found in everyone else was persistence. They'd get a hold of an idea and they'd stick with that idea. And I look back in my own life and I never did that. I'd try something a couple of times and if it was rough, I quit. I'd have people say, oh, Bob, why don't you just give it up? I'd say, yeah, you're right, and I would. Now, you see, the people I was mixing with, they were losing too. I never stuck at anything. So I made up my mind, if I ever found this secret, I'd work it right until I died. Now, I did find the secret. It was in a hundred different places in the book, and it was simply sit down, decide what you want, write it on a card, carry the card in your pocket, and read it as often as possible every day. Now, keep in mind, I was earning 4000 I owed six. I was sitting in a fire hall at the time. And I wrote on the card that I was going to have my possession by New Year's Day of 1970, $25,000. Now, I wrote that on the card in 1960. You know, the idea of uh, having $25,000, it, uh, it was sort of a fantasy. 
I don't think there was $25,000 in the whole fire hall at the time. Now, I wrote that in the card in 1960, keep in mind. I gave myself a decade to pull this deal off. I really didn't believe it was going to happen. But I found out a couple of things. I found if you write a lie on a card and you read it often enough, you're going to start to believe it. And you know, William, Ring, or, um, William James, back around the turn of the century, he said, believe and your belief will actually create the fact. Well, I did what he suggested. I read this card every day. I'd carry it around and I'd just keep reading it. And uh, one day one of the guys in the fire hall got a hold of it and they pulled the card away and they passed it all around. Everybody started to laugh. Proctor's going to get rich. I had a chap in a seminar the other day that uh, he said the same thing had happened to him. He was in a seminar and, then, and he got one of these gold cards and they passed it around at work and he said, everybody laughed at me, but he said, I'm winning. Now, I didn't read the card in front of anyone any longer, but I kept reading it. I'd go to the bathroom, I'd sit in the toilet, and lock the door, and I'd read the card. Or I'd be driving down the, uh, I'd be driving down the street, and I'd come to a traffic light, and I'd haul the card out, and I'd read it. Now, something very funny happened to me. One year later, I was earning $175,000 a year. Now, that's an enormous change, and it went well beyond a million in a year. Now, that was not supposed to happen. See, everything I'd been taught since I was a little boy indicated that if you don't go to school, you can't win. If you don't have business easier experience, you can't win. I had not gone to school. My second month in high school, they asked me to leave. I'll never forget how happy I was when they made that decision. <laughs> As I look back, they were probably much happier than I was when they made that decision. But here I was, I, uh, I was 16, I had very little knowledge, I had absolutely no skills, and at the very best, my attitude was poor. What chance did I have? I really didn't have any, but I didn't know that. And so I just bummed around from job to job in another Navy and another factories and another bars, mostly in another bars, until I was 26. Here I was at 26 when Ray sat down with me. I had very little knowledge, absolutely no skills, and my attitude had not improved greatly. But he introduced me to this idea. And I found that it doesn't matter what's happened in the past. You may not have a colorful background, and maybe you have. You may not have a lot of formal education, and maybe you have. But it really doesn't matter if you've got a goal and you're willing to stick to it and study the laws, you're going to find out that you can win. Now, that was like an emotional impact. And I had to find out what happened to me. And so I made up my mind that someone had either written in a book or they were, uh, they were talking about it. And I made up my mind I'd read every book that was ever written if I had to. And I'm going to tell you, I have one of the finest libraries on personal development, psychology, the area of the mind that you're going to find anywhere. And I don't just mean library of books, I mean library of tapes and records. And I would travel anywhere in the world that I heard of a good seminar to find out more about myself. Find out more about you. Find out what makes us tick. And you know a strange thing? I found as I studied me, I understood you better. Because we are essentially all the same. And that's just sort of the way it works. This seminar is nothing but the culmination of all that study. But it wasn't just study, it was a lot of practice, a lot of painstaking study, and an awful lot of experience. And uh, John and I have seen great changes take place in our own life, but better still, we've taken, seen phenomenal changes take place in the lives of the thousands and countless thousands of people that have studied these seminars. We've done these seminars as far away as Takapuna, New Zealand. And we've done them all over the United States, every state in the United States. And we've done them all across Canada. People in England are studying this right now. As a matter of fact, this book, Born Rich, is being read in Russia right now. Uh, that's a, a, a fair distance away from here. And it's a lot different philosophy than most people in that country are used to. Now, we point out here that material wealth is a normal and a natural state for you to live in. Intellectual comprehension. Come down to the third paragraph on page two. It's vitally important. Intellectual comprehension of this program is not difficult. In a relatively short period of time, you will be prepared to correctly answer a battery of questions about this Born Rich program. If you read it, memorize it, you could answer almost any question in it. But that doesn't mean that you're going to win. You could very quickly say, I know. Someone mentioned something. I'll say, I know. I know somebody that says that all the time. Doesn't matter what you say to her. Vera says, I know. All right. Now, knowing and doing are poles apart. And I point out in two or three places in the book that reading and memorizing are not going to make you successful. It's the understanding and then the application of wise thoughts that count. 
you must understand the idea and you must go out and act on the idea regardless of how much your old program wants to hold you back. You've got to bust out of that shell and do the thing that you've got to do. Now John Ruskin here gives us an excellent concept in education. He said education does not mean teaching people what they do not know. It means teaching them, showing them, leading them to behave as they do not behave. Now, the compensation that you're going to receive for following the ideas that you're going to be studying for the next couple of days is absolutely incredible. I could do nothing but uh, keep expressing great ideas when I talk about the good that can come to you. You can do anything you want. You can have anything you want by following these ideas. Now, I choose to believe that every one of you wants something. Way down deep inside of you is a dream. And every now and then that dream floats to the surface of your conscious mind. And when it dies, you quickly push it out and you say, I can't do that. Now the truth is you can, you just don't know how. And if you can get that straight in your mind, I'm going to tell you, you've busted out. Now Vernon Howard one time pointed out in a magnificent book, Mystic Path to Cosmic Power, you cannot escape from a prison if you don't know you're in one. You cannot escape from a prison if you don't know you're in one. Well, I think we're all in one to some degree. But that dream you've got that comes to your mind, I would suggest you look at it real carefully. I was given a cassette tape by a gentleman in a seminar that we were conducting a couple of years ago, and it was a copy of a speech made by a minister out of Minneapolis. And there were a couple of lines in that tape that were absolutely incredible. He said the saddest thing when he's officiating at a funeral is not the death of the body, but the death of all the dreams. It's that house you were going to build and never built. Maybe that car you were going to get and never got. The trip you were going to take and never took. The business you were going to start and build, but never did. Well, the saddest thing is not the death of the body, but it is the death of all the dreams. We've got to do what's inside of us. Let's not go to the grave with the music still in us. Now, as we go through this seminar, John's coming on in a minute to lead you through the part about proper use of the seminar. But as we go through it, understand this. If you do not direct all of the information you're going to hear towards a specific end, the information will probably be rendered useless. So what I would suggest you do as John's coming up here, just jot down in shorthand in your book, anywhere on a blank space, that's something that you want. And look at the quote on the bottom of page two. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, do the thing and you'll get the energy to do the thing. Do the thing and you'll get the energy to do the thing. Don't wait. Start right now whether you're ready or not. Just say, I'm going after it. I'm going to get it. And your present circumstance has got nothing to do with where you're going. Later on in the book here, you're going to find that there's a quote by a magnificent author. He said, your circumstances may be uncongenial right now. But they will not long remain so if you perceive an ideal and strive to reach it. Now think of that. You may not have much money. Your social life may be in a bit of a chaotic state. Maybe your business isn't going the way you'd really want it to go. He said your circumstances may be uncongenial. But they will not long remain so if you perceive an ideal and strive to reach it. Now flip over to the next page and I'm going to invite John back on to lead you through how to get the proper use out of this program. And I don't suppose there's a better guy that I know to be able to do that because I watched John start, and there's a story of him in Born Rich, I watched John start from ground zero and just keep making headway. John Canary learned how to use the ideas in this program so well that he's a very competent teacher of the ideas today. What I left the seminar with was a desire to want to know more. There was something about it that, uh, that stimulated a desire within me of all the things I ever wanted to do, but no one ever told me that I could do it. And I believe when I walked away from there, I felt very comfortable, at least with the idea that, hey, there is, a, there is something about me that if I learn to use it properly, that I could actually go out and achieve it. Even though I didn't know how, I believed that that was a starting point. So that was the beginning for me and what I got most out of that particular seminar. I believe where, uh, where we went from there is at that time there was only, there was only perhaps a half day to a one day seminar. And it was structured around the Earl Nightingale material, of course. 
and it wasn't as, I guess you could say, as prolific as it is today, although it was as energetic as it was today, you know, probably even more so. But today there seems to be a smoother flow, a more structured presentation, a more organized presentation in a way that, in a way that an individual can actually take it and use a step-by-step -step methodical approach to actually working with their creative process. At that time it was more of, you know, why not take a look at yourself and try to recognize that there's potential within you and that if you set a goal, which I did at that time, and sitting in the front row of the seminar, just about that time, I took something called a goal card, which it wasn't as beautiful as it is today. It wasn't as organized or arranged as it is today. But that was back in around 1970, 71, in that period of time. And I remember Bob mentioning, if you take a card, write something on it that you want to do. And if you read it every day and do the best you can every day, you're going to achieve it. Now, I don't know how many people that day you know, wrote something on a card, but I would say most of them were actually writing something out. But I think it had a profound impact on me to the point that I wrote down that I was going to be doing what Proctor was doing. And even more importantly, that I was going to be doing it with him. Now, <laughs> uh, I'm sure that I, I, I talked to him on a number of occasions that particular day, but I was just like anyone else sitting in the audience. Uh, he. He probably heard that story from a number of people or related goals, something of that nature. But I knew that I was going to, I didn't know how. So wherever uh, he was running a program, because I identified so much with the way that he explained it, there were so many people talking about how to in their seminars and I was exposed to that. I was in training courses with respect to the product that I was selling at that time. But he was getting to a point where it was it was kind of like uh, it was kind of like all of a sudden you could see you could see that you could do it even though you know there was no special methodical method to doing it. So when I walked out of there that day with a three by five card with something written on it to the to the effect that I was going to be doing this program like he was doing it and with him, I, I was I was wondering what would happen if I had told a lot of people that. Well, I didn't bother telling anybody, but I kept going back to every seminar that was being conducted, no matter where it was, if it was in Chicago, in Toronto, if it was in London, if it was in Kingston or Montreal, that's where I would end up. And I think that, you know, the fact that I was available so much and in every seminar, that Proctor began to wonder, who is this guy? And before long, he started calling me and we started to develop pretty good relationship, pretty good friendship. Uh, the rest of that is history, of course. I've worked with every major company, uh, people from every walk of life, uh, from professional hockey teams, professional baseball teams, many major corporations and uh, have not regretted one day of it, as tough as it's been. So let's give John a real warm welcome as he come on and lead you through that. You know, any time I start a seminar like this, I always like to start with the balls. And one of the reasons that I use this is because it had such a dramatic impact on my own life. And I knew that this worked in a physical sense as I just took a look and stared at it. But I wasn't quite sure how it worked in every other sense. And I know many people that when they get an understanding of how this works, that if you put a little bit into life, you're only going to get a little bit out of life. In other words, if you want to spend a lot of time complaining about what's wrong in life, that's just about the only thing you're ever going to find in your life. I like to put it another way. If you want to look at the scientific side of things, they'll say that for every action, there is an equal reaction in the opposite direction. If you want to go over to the other side to see what the theologian has to say or the philosophers, they'll tell you exactly the same thing. They'll say that as ye sow, so shall ye reap. And then there's a way that I kind of like to use it. And it works this way. That the only thing that can flow into your life or mine, whether it be in a financial sense, whether it be in your personal life, whether it be in your family life, one thing is for certain. That the only thing that can flow into your life is based on 
What's flowing out of your life? I know that any time that I have this sitting at home, and uh, some of the uh, some of my uh, son's uh, buddies will come by, he'll always take them over. They'll say, "What's this?" And he'll take it and he'll say, "Well, you see, what this means if you put a little bit in, you get a little bit out. But if you put a whole lot in, you get a whole lot out. That's just the way it works." Now you see, we can make what is called a conscious choice here today on what we're going to take out of this program. If you wanted to spend a little bit of time trying to find out why this program won't work, I guarantee you, you're going to find it. But there's only one reason you can ever find something wrong with anything. And that's because there must be something right with it. You see, you can't have one without the other. I mean, how would you know a good paycheck if you didn't know a bad paycheck? I mean, you can't have a hot without a cold, you can't have an up without a down, an in without an out. I mean, all the books we use here, if you look at the book Bob was using, Think and Grow Rich, it has an inside and an outside, it has back, has front. And you know, most interesting thing that I found about that is not too long ago, I was doing a seminar out in Calgary, and I was at a place called the Porta Call Inn. And you know, I was standing down in the basement there doing this seminar in a place like this, but there was uh, fewer people. And at the back of the room, there was this beautiful, magnificent glass window. And as you look through it, you could see the magnificence of the mountains. And all along the top of the mountains, you could see the beautiful snow-capped tops and the peaks. And the sun was just bouncing right off the top of those mountains. And I made an analogy quickly. I said, isn't it interesting that the only reason we can appreciate the magnificence of that mountain is because it is sitting in what is called a valley. Now, folks, everybody here today has the ability to do just one of three things. You have the ability to take anything that you're going to hear. I mean, as you sit there, you can take and gather all this information and you can completely reject it. You can do that. Or you can take all the information and you can neglect it. And that's what a lot of people do. They get it and they neglect it. Or you can take the information and you can accept it. Now, I'm going to make a suggestion to all of you. I want you to just sit there and really think about this. Don't accept what you hear. Don't reject what you hear. And please, don't neglect what you hear. But you know, folks, only a fool would not take an idea, examine that idea, Kick that idea around to see if it will change, see if it will alter, or see if it will improve the end result for a happier, healthier, more productive life. Now, I've always felt that, and I guess I've learned this over a, a number of years, that the biggest task that I have almost every day of my life is that I have to take an idea that I have and communicate that idea to another individual in a way that will enrich their life. And, and you could say that that's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but you know, it is simple. And I guess the best story that illustrates this goes something like this. There was a professor one time showed up at a university like this one, and he walked in the back door and all his colleagues grabbed him. He was at a convention. And they said, Doctor, are we ever glad you're here? He said, well, what's going on? He said, well, there's 500 people here and the guest speaker hasn't shown up. He said, and you've been announced as the guest speaker. <laughs> oh, now, hold on a minute. He said, I'm not one to go out there and give a talk in front of all my colleagues. But he said, what's the subject? He said, that's the thing, you see. You're the only one that showed up without your spouse. That's why you're giving the talk. Well, he said, what is it? said, the subject's on sex. Oh, no, not me. I'm not going up there in front of all those people who know me. No, he, just then his name was announced, and up he went. He got up and he stood behind that lectern there, and he just gave a 40-minute performance to just knock your socks up. And after it was all over, got a standing ovation, away he went home, felt pretty good. He said, I should get on the circuit here. I know a lot of people like that. And he walked in the door and his wife, Martha, greeted him there with a big hug and a kiss. And she said, well, dear, how the convention go? Said, well, dear, as a matter of fact, it was great. I was the guest speaker. 
said, dear, you don't know anything about speaking. I knew that. They didn't know that. Went along great. <laughs> said, well, dear, what'd you talk about? Now, he's not a dumb guy, right? He said, honey, he said, I'll be up all night if I tell her. Oh, he said, honey, I talked about sailing. George, you don't know anything about sailing. Well, I knew that, and they didn't know that. And they s seemed to like it. Well, off they went to bed. Now, the next day, Martha's out doing the shopping. And so were all the girls that were at the convention. <laughs> now, just to show you how two people are talking about who they think they're talking about the same thing, but in reality, they're not. They only think they are, but they have two different ideas. And they all spotted Martha, and they ran over, and they said, Martha, we didn't know Charlie was such an authority on the subject. Oh, she said, girls, he isn't really the old fool. He only did it twice. <laughs> and you know what? The first time, his hat fell off, and the second time, he fell over the side. <laughs> now, there were two people who thought they were talking about the same thing. Well, the idea that we're, we're, we're working with here today is to take an idea we have, transfer that idea to you as an individual, but there's only one way we can do that, is you've got to kind of let go of the resistance, you've got to get hang a little bit loose because it is somewhat disturbing. Some of the information disturbs people sometimes. It really does. It actually does. It was a Bishop Sheen, was given a great talk every Sunday afternoon. And one Sunday afternoon, he was giving the talk, fellow put his hand up in the eye and said, Hold a minute, Bishop, you don't believe all that jazz, do you? Oh, he said, I believe it all. He said, Come on, Bishop, you don't believe that story that Jonah was in the stomach of the whale? Ah, oh, he said, I believe it, Bishop. He said, Come on, Bishop, not Jonah in the stomach of the whale. He said, Come on, you're a grown man. No, he said, I believe it. He said, Well, tell me, Bishop, how are you going to prove it? Well, he said, I'll tell you what. When I get to heaven, I'll ask him. Say, yeah, but Bishop, what if you don't find him there? He said, then you can ask him. <laughs> so you see, if you want to reject it, you want to neglect it, go ahead. I know the information works. On page three, at the very top, the suggested use of this program, and you know... Bob mentioned earlier that I've actually taken these ideas and I've made them work. As a matter of fact, I can remember when I first picked up uh, the information from this program, I believe it was uh, Earl Nightingale's Lead the Field. And uh, I was given a suggested use of how to use that program, which took five minutes. Bob was working with Nightingale at that time, I wasn't. And uh, he sold me a program for $245, that was back 1968. That was a lot of money, 1968, that's a lot of money today for a lot of people. And he said, now here's what you do. You take this tape, put it in your cassette player. I didn't have one of those. And he said, what you do is turn the cassette on because it wasn't a popular thing in cars. But he said, you listen to the first tape all week. Then go to the second one and listen to that all week. That was the suggested use of the program at that time. So you see, I've watched this program grow up. Not only grow up, but I've been able to take it and maximize it more than any individual I know that has ever gone through this seminar. And I can say that, and I can say it with conviction, I can say it with commitment. So let me just walk you through a couple of steps. Born Rich is the beginning of an exciting journey you're about to take. And like all journeys, which are properly planned and completely enjoyed, you must have these four basic points. You've got to work these four basic points. See, it's the old idea that there are two simple words that we could implement to really get the results we want. The first one is called order. Order. Order is the very first law of creation. And the second word is movement. And when you have order and movement working in your life, what begins to happen is there's a pattern of growth that begins to develop. You see, I think that we try to get here without first covering or bridging the gap of these steps along the way. So if we have the order, and the order is, is to make a decision that no matter where I am, no matter how well I am doing, 
I can do better, and I'm going to set an objective to bring about that order. And then we use the movement, which is known as a system, and I believe that born rich is a system. I don't believe it, I know it. You don't have to believe something until you understand it, then you don't have to believe it anymore. But belief is the fuel to get you off the ground. So the first step, a clear understanding of where the journey begins. A very clear understanding of where the journey begins, and I don't know anybody that'll do that more effectively than Robert when he comes back up to start going through the basic concept and the creative process. Number two, checkpoints and route to help you stay on course. You see, I believe we know, for the most part, a lot of us what we want. And as Napoleon Hill said time and time again in this great book, he said, you must know what you want, why you want it, when you want it, and an idea on how you're going to get it. You must know what you want, you must know why you want it, you must know, he said, when you want it, and he said, you must have an idea on how you're going to get it. So we need checkpoints and route to help us stay on course. Number three, a clear understanding of your destination. I believe one of the greatest definitions that I've ever heard of success in my life is that success is not a destination ever has been, but it is something called a journey. It has always been what is called a journey. It, it is not something you get, it is something you're becoming. It never ends. It's infinite in terms of growth. And number four, a commitment. You know, I've spent a lot of time studying, as everyone else, books such as In Search of Excellence, In Pursuit of Excellence. I know when I look at Paul Hutsey, I think a lot about excellence. And you know, excellence is perhaps one of the most important words in your life. Well, one of the reasons for that is because Paul knew about excellence 20 years ago. His company, they published something called In Search of Excellence and The Pursuit of Excellence. But what does the word mean? I hear people say excellence in this, excellence in that. What does the word mean to you? Well, I'm going to tell you what the word really means. It means a commitment to completion. Folks, you never ever want to forget that. Excellence is simply a commitment to completion. The steps are not easy, but the understanding of the steps are easy. If you remember, it's a commitment to completion. That means completing the things around home. It means completing the things at your work. It means completing the commitments in your personal life. It's a commitment to completion. You will agree a person would be very foolish to tell themselves they are presently in Atlanta, Georgia, and their destination is Dallas. If, in fact, they were actually in Calgary, Alberta, with Dallas, Texas as their, as their destination. Do you know how many people that are trying to set a goal, they don't know where they're at, consequently, they don't know how to get there? Unbelievable as this may seem, this is the classical error millions of people make philosophically with their lives. They are not completely honest with themselves when it comes to recognizing where they presently are where they presently are. Honest answers to every question and serious consideration to every exercise and suggestion will clearly indicate three points. And this is what this program is about, is these three points. Where your journey begins. That's number one. Number two, the mental adjustments that must be made. The mental adjustments that must be made. Let me give you an example. Anytime working with a young person, I just love working with young people. They only have to understand what a mental adjustment is and they'll make it quicker than you and I. Are you aware that your kids, your kids, they only have to what is called make up their mind. You and I have to change our mind. We can teach them how to make a mental adjustment and here is the major mental adjustment that all of us have to make. Simple one. You must regard all adversity. You must regard all circumstance, all conditions in your life. If you could look at it as though it were an investment in which you can attract and learn more about growth in your life. It's an investment only. What a difference we'd find in everything that we do. And number three, approximate time 
it will take to complete the journey. The approximate time it will take to complete the journey. Now before you become emerged in your Born Rich program, form the attitude that this program has been prepared especially for you. This is for you. This is not for me. This is not, it's just not, not for, for me only. It's not for Bob. It's for you. Especially prepared for you. Imagine that the author, that the speaker is a clear personal friend um, whom, you, whom you have chosen as your mentor. I wonder how many of us have a mentor. I always say when a program ends, it's the beginning. It really is. It says, make a commitment to yourself that you will follow every instruction necessary to alter. And you're going to hear this word so often. To alter your old conditioning. Now I want you to think, what is old conditioning? Do you know, any time that you get these buried pain remembrances, these nagging little things that grab us when we're trying to do something, or that tell us we can't do it, why we can't do it, and all these things that are just kind of like grabbing at us, these doubts and worries, that's your conditioning. You know, I'd give anything if a person would just grab hold of one idea, this one simple idea. Any time that you get feedback telling you why you can't do something, if only, folks, you could remember it's not a reflection of your potential or you as a person, but it is a reflection of your conditioning. I'd give anything for a person just to understand that. When you get that old feeling that you can't do something, you can only remember it's a reflection of your conditioning and not a reflection of your potential. Now, I want you to think about this. Everybody is familiar with the great Bruce Lee, perhaps the greatest martial artist that ever lived. And you know, he was also a great teacher. And very often, people would, they'd come to him and they'd say, could you tell us, Master, how we could be a great martial artist like you? Now, he would take him out into a little gym and he would go through some of his moves. And what he was doing is he was trying to find out where they are. Because he said most people had the wrong information about martial arts. Just like many people have the wrong information about this word, success. This word success, this progressive realization of a worthy ideal. And after he'd take them through the little exam, he would sit down at a table, he'd put them on one end. He'd sit on the other end. And he'd put in front of them a glass of Coke. He'd say, I want you to look at that and let it represent. Think about it now. He said, I want you to let this glass of Coke represent your knowledge. This is what you know to be the truth. And he said, I want you to let this, this clear water, represent what is the truth. This is my knowledge. This is what I've learned. And he said, this is what you want from me. This is what you want. I want you to think about one step here. How often have we looked into the lives of other people and we see things that we truly admire? We look at maybe their person. What I give to be like that individual. We look at what they have and we say, what I would give to have what they have. We look at what they do and we say, what I would give to do what they do. Folks, if we only knew what we're looking at are nothing more but our own rejected thoughts. They accepted thoughts that we have rejected. So this is what Bruce said. I can't give you my knowledge because you see, there's too much of yours. However, he said, if you are prepared to let go of yours and make room for mine, 
then we can work together. But as long as you hold on to this, I can't give you this. Think about it. Are you prepared to let go of what you've learned? And by that, I don't mean to just cast it aside, but to examine it. And to take a new idea that you will hear in two days here. A new idea. And to examine that idea, entertain that idea, to see if it will change, alter, and or improve the end result for a happier, healthier, more prosperous life. If you're prepared to do that, this program will really, really work for you. Will really work for you. Would you go back to the book with me, please? Second last paragraph. Rather than merely listening to the messages, questions and exercises, think. Think deep, penetrating thoughts. Ask yourself, what does this mean to me? How can I apply this idea to my life? Remember, not how can I apply it to someone else's life. How can I apply this idea to personal growth and development in my life? Because the simple basic laws of life are create or disintegrate. We're either moving forward or we're going backwards. And the last paragraph, set aside a definite period of time every day, weekends and holidays included, for the proper use of your Born Rich program. In other words, make a decision. See, folks, we don't have as many problems as we have decisions to make. By that, I'm not asking or suggesting that you should discount your problems. I would never suggest that. But you know, I am suggesting that you have the talent, the ability, the potential to handle and to deal with your problems. So do we have as many problems as we have decisions to make? It says, for the proper use of your Born Rich program, you must set aside different times to work with it. You eat every day to nourish your body. Look at your Born Rich program as a form of healthy nourishment. For your marvelous mind, and use it daily until its use becomes habitual. Until its use becomes habitual. Now, in two minutes, I'm going to bring Bob up here to go through the basic concept, which is the real star of this program, is what you're going to see on the board. It's what it's all about. The first time I was introduced to this concept, believe me, it hit me. I had such impact on me. Didn't change anything right away, but it showed me a way to do it. In 1973, I had something written on a goal card. Had something written on a goal card. And on that goal card, there was something very interesting. I said, on March the 1st, 1973, what I wanted to do was this very program. Now, at that time, I could not lead, I could not lead this group, this group, you could say, in silent prayer. I could not have led this group in silent prayer. Could not. But I wrote on it that March the 1st, this is what I was going to do. Now, when February the 28th rolled around, now I tell you this for your benefit, not mine. For your benefit. Because someone sitting here today is probably thinking exactly what I was thinking, but maybe in a different, different area. I had absolutely no credentials to do this. None. Absolutely none. And for three years prior, four years prior, I, wherever Robert was doing a seminar, I'd be there. Paul Hutsey knows that. I'd fly wherever he'd fly, I'd go wherever he was, and I'd sit in the front row. I have at home maybe a couple of thousand workbooks from seminars. A couple of thousand. Notes all through them. Some of them can't even read them anymore. Now on February the 28th, after four to five years of a lot of pain, and there was, four to five years of a lot of traveling, and there was, a whole lot, a whole lot. There was a lot of things. 
You know what really happened? On February the 28th, I was no closer to the goal. Now remember, it was one day away. One day away. I was no closer to the goal. After five years. Kind of disheartening and discouraging, isn't it? So this is what happened. I got a phone call from Chicago. It was Robert. On February the 28th, 1973. And he said, John, I got some bad news for you. I can't get to Toronto. Chicago is closed. He said, you're going to have to do the seminar in the morning. Now, here it was. It's what I always wanted to do. And the first thing that hit me was fear, panic. And I remember giving him a gold card. And he said, you obviously had something to do with the Chicago airport closing. <laughs> but to the day, it worked. Even though all the appearances said it wouldn't work. But you know what? I made a decision. This was my knowledge. This was his. I had to get rid of mine to get his. That's what you're going to have to do today and tomorrow. So what do you say we bring Robert back up for the remainder of the morning to really get this creative process rolling? Bob? So what do you say we bring Robert back up for the remainder of the morning to really get this creative process rolling? Bob? Thank you, John. I want to suggest now that you really put on your thinking hat. I have a paper here that was written by a gentleman who has since passed away. He was a great Canadian. His name was Dr. Lawrence Rampell. And when I first moved back to Canada from the United States about eight years ago, Dr. Rampell was sitting right here where Mr. Kavuk, the great photographer, is sitting. And this man took more notes than anyone I had ever seen in a seminar. I honestly thought if I could have got a copy of his notes that I would have probably had a transcript of what I was saying. Now, I made up my mind I'd get to know him after the seminar was over. I wanted to know why he wanted to have all this written. And he introduced himself as Dr. Rampell. I asked him if he was a medical doctor. He said, no. And I said, are you a dentist? He said, no. And I said, are you a chiropractor? He said, no. I said, do you want to play 20 questions? And he laughed, you know. And he said, no, he had a doctorate's degree in thinking. Now, do you know, he had the only doctorate's degree in thinking that had ever, up till that time, come out of the University of Toronto. It took him 11 years to get it. Every time he went to go down a road, somebody put a block up in front of him and say, no one has a doctorate's degree in thinking. Now, that's rather odd, especially when you consider that thinking is the highest function of which a human being is capable, and all the great leaders all down through history have been in complete and unanimous agreement that you and I become what we think about. Now, play with that for a moment. It's a subject that is not taught in school. It's the highest function of which we're capable. And every great leader that has ever lived all told us that you and I become what we think about most of the time. Dr. Rampell wrote a paper, Tools for Teaching Thinking. He said, thinking is a skill which can be learned just as we learn skills such as typing and playing the piano. Now, he said, few public schools offer courses devoted expressly to teaching thinking. Rather, we are expected to learn and teach thinking as a byproduct of learning mathematics, reading, science, history, trade, and so forth. And he said, we do, in fact, learn a lot about thinking in this way. The trouble is, we learn our thinking skills in bits and pieces, and we never put it together as an overall picture. If asked to describe what all is required in order to think effectively, most people would be at a loss to give a complete account. 
Thus, we are unable to assess our own thinking skills or systematically teach the skill of thinking to others. Now, consider this for a moment. When you think, you think in pictures. Check it out. I'm going to suggest that you think of the home you live in, and as you do, realize that an image of your home comes on to the screen of your mind. It's almost as if there's a screen running right through the center of our head, and the second we think of our home, the picture of the home comes on to the screen of our mind. Now I want to suggest that you think of your automobile. And the second you think of your automobile, the picture of the home is gone and the picture of the automobile is there. Think of your kitchen, your backyard. Think of where you work or go to school. And bang, 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 just like that, the picture changes. We literally think in pictures. Now I'm going to suggest that you think of your mind. Now when most people think of their mind, they get an image of the brain. How many thought of the brain? Quite a few hands going up. And yet, you know, the brain is not the mind any more than the fingernail is. And paradoxically, the fingernail and the brain is the mind. You see, mind is an activity and body is the manifestation of that activity. And we're going to find out as we go along through the morning and this afternoon that the body is really nothing but an instrument of the mind. Now, your brain is comprised of hundreds of thousands of cells. Into these cells, we impregnate pictures or images. And as we think, we activate that particular group of brain cells, and the picture that's in them flashes on the screen of the mind. Now, I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Flip over onto page five in your exercise book. At the top of the page, it's talking about me and money. Now, when you think of yourself and you think of money, what kind of a picture do you get? You know, the vast majority of people get a picture of, po of poverty. And what we want to do is take and build cells of recognition in your brain for prosperity. So we're talking about me and money. That's you and your money. Now we say the program was written in the sincere hope that it would lead you. And that's all we could do is lead you. It's like Dr. Billy B. Sharp in Chicago. He said, a person will not believe something until they discover it for themselves. So we just actually want to lead you to this new awareness. Well, we want to lead you to the many discoveries that lie within you. And we're going to do that through the repetition of prosperous ideas. What we're going to do is tell you one thing 10,000 times and 10,000 different ways. And we're going to cause pictures to fly on the screen of your mind until you get a clear picture of greatness and prosperity locked up within you, because that's what they're, regardless of whether you understand that or not at this point. Now, we're suggesting that you start to see money. Whenever you think of money, see this stuff as an obedient, diligent servant. You're the master, it's the servant. And don't ever get that equation reversed, or you're going to find yourself in very, very deep trouble. You can use this to provide service far beyond your own physical presence. If you and I had no money, we'd still be able to provide service, but the service that we provided would be confined to our physical presence at any given place or any given time. However, if we had some money, we could provide that service far beyond our own physical presence. So let's make certain that we get that programmed into those cells properly. Now you come down a little further, we're going to say here that lack and limitation can only exist when we make room for them in our mind. But prosperity consciousness knows no lack and it knows no limitation. Now, I want to suggest that you resolve to just completely take the lid off your marvelous mind. Just blow it away. And let the greatness start to flow around in there. Now, flip over to the next page. When we start thinking about money, and we start thinking about ourselves, as I suggested, we get images on the screen of our mind. Now, on page six, we say throughout your entire Born Rich seminar, your attention is directed at the importance of your mind. The type of thoughts and ideas which occupy your consciousness are of paramount importance in developing prosperity in your life. 
Your mind is either in an orderly or a confused state. Order must prevail. John mentioned that a little, or, a little earlier. Order and movement are what necessary. Well, we start with the order. So we say order must prevail in your mind if you ever hope to see it manifest in your material world. Now, you want order in your material world. That means meaningful relationships. That means prosperity and growth in our business. It could mean all kinds of things that are good, but they all have to start in here. Everything starts in our mind. Well, if we're going to have order in our mind, we must have an image of our mind, and most people don't have. So what we're going to do as we go through the seminar is build brain cells. Now that may sound a little strange to some of you. You may be sitting there and thinking, well, this is ridiculous. How can I build brain cells sitting watching this box? Well, I can assure you that you can, and I'm going to convince you very shortly that you're able to. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use different examples as we go through this seminar. And each one of these examples are real live examples, every one of them. This is a letter that I received on February the 18th, 1986. It came from Joanne White. She was the regional administrator to the vice president of sales for the Metropolitan Insurance Company in Kansas City. Now, Joanne was in a seminar there in January of 1986. This letter is dated February of 86. And when Joanne came to the seminar in 1986, she told me a fascinating story. Now, apparently, she had come to a seminar that I conducted in Kansas City 10 years prior to this in 1976. Now, I didn't remember Joanne, nor did I remember her son, who she was telling me the story of. But when she told me what happened, I quickly related to it because it's happened many times and there's many situations that I do remember. Apparently, we had been doing seminars right across the country for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, and a friend of hers in another area had been talking to her on the phone, who also worked for the same company, and this friend told her, if this seminar ever comes to Kansas City, make sure you go and take your son. Well, she took that person's advice and she came. She brought her 11-year-old son, Eric, who had been diagnosed as having learning disabilities. Now, keep your mind open here, folks, because this is real. It happened, and it can happen to anyone. Someone had made a classical error, and someone, possibly in a position of authority, in fact, probably in a position of authority, and they told this lady and her husband that their 11-year-old son had learning disabilities and not to expect too much from him. So they didn't. Worse still, the little boy didn't expect much from himself. I told her to bring the little boy to the seminar, and we just built new brain cells, that that child could do anything he wanted. But this idea of learning disabilities was an error that someone had made, and they shouldn't believe it any longer. And I said, you bring him, have him sit right near the front, and I said, we'll give him a little special attention, and you'll just watch the change take place. Let me read you the letter. She's Dear Bob, I wanted to take a moment to tell you how much I had gained from your seminar in Kansas City and how much I am continuing to gain from the use of your tapes. Now, at that time, all we had is audio tapes. Now, you can sit and you can watch this over and over and over again because there's going to be parts of it that will seem a little confusing to you first time through. But as you play it over and over and over again, the confusion will leave and order is going to come to your mind. There's many times I'll take a book and I'll read the same paragraph over and over again. This book that I mentioned earlier of Napoleon Hill's, I've been reading that for 27 years. Now, it's not such that I'm such a slow learner. It's just there's so much depth in the book. My wife's sitting back there and she said, no, it's not the depth, it's that you're a slow learner. <laughs> but, uh, and anyway, that, that's just her opinion. All right. Now, she said, I listen to the tapes each time I get in my car, and I intend to continue to do so. And, of course, you've got the audio cassettes from the seminar as well, so you can just snap them into your car. Remember this. If you only drive 25,000 miles a year, you're spending 13, 40-hour weeks behind the wheel of that automobile, all of which your conscious mind is free to travel around and do anything it wants to do. Your body is programmed to drive the car. 
Well, she says, Bob, I'm sure at times you ponder over the long range effects of these seminars. Do you merely get people excited and then once you leave town, forget it? Well, she's, I attended your seminar when you were in Kansas City 10 years ago. I brought my 11-year-old son who was going through some trying times in school. He had been diagnosed as having learning disabilities and he was really struggling. Listen to this. He was certain he was a reject. What a terrible thought to be running through the little kid's mind. I'm a reject. Many adults running around with that thought in their mind. You could have been sitting with that thought in your mind. You might be sitting with that thought in your mind. I'm a reject. There's no such thing as rejects. God didn't make any rejects. But she says, I brought Eric to the seminars. He learned that you can do anything or be anything that you believe you can. He learned to set goals and to achieve the goals that he set. Listen to this for progress. I am very proud to tell you there was both an immediate and a long range change in Eric's performance. In that same school year, his grade spiraled upwards and he became an honor student. Eric attended Bay State. He is an Eagle Scout. He was listed in Who's Who in American high schools. He was editor of his school paper. He qualified for scholarships, that's plural. He had his choice for college. And at the present time, he's a junior at the University of Missouri and he's on the Dean's List. I feel a great deal of this can be credited to the fact that this 11-year-old boy learned he could do anything he believed he could and he became a goal setter. Joanne concluded by saying, Bob, I just wanted to share this letter with you as I really do not know if we would be able to tell this success story if I had not brought Eric to this seminar. I'll always be grateful. I guess she will. And I guess Eric will too. And what was the big win? Was it the who's who in American high schools? Was it being editor of his school paper? Was it the honors that he accomplished that first year? Was it the college scholarships in college? I don't think so. I don't think any of those things were the big win. You know what the big win was? It was the one single idea that enabled him to do all these things. And one idea can cause you to make the progress this young boy made. We have a gentleman in our audience, I'm not quite sure where he is. He's a good friend of mine, Grant Sylvester. He's the president of Money Concepts for Canada. And uh, Grant Sylvester hired us to conduct these seminars way back in the 70s for a large company that he was a senior executive in. And right across the country, they had a 53% increase in sales. Now that's hundreds of people, that's an enormous increase. I want you to think about that for a moment. Here's an idea they give this little boy, honors in schools, gave Grant's company a 50% increase in sales. So you see, I don't really care what you do, it doesn't matter what you're doing, it's you that counts, and the more you understand you, the better your results you're going to get. Now, I'm going to run through a very quick idea, and it's very simple. Don't let the simplicity of this idea deceive you. What we're going to do is run through a concept and explain just how brain cells are built. Now, I'm going to ask someone from the audience, uh, Nino, you're a good friend, come up to the front here for a moment. All right, Nino. Wonderful, Bob. Give Nino a hand. Uh, and if you're sitting in your office or sitting at home, I want you to meet one of the best managers I know. Thank you. And I mean that sincerely, and I'm not just saying that to flatter Nino. I'm saying that because of the results that I see as people get. Uh, Nino was uh, kind enough to hire my son and daughter-in-law to go to work for them at the beginning of this year, and every month this year, they have earned somewhere between twenty and forty-five thousand dollars a month. Now you don't do that if you haven't got a real good manager drawing the best out of you. Management is the development of people, it's not the direction of things. So Nino's a very good friend of mine. Now Nino, I want to ask you a couple of questions. I'm going to do something. What I'd like you to do is hold out your hand like this. All right? Now I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Now I would like you to look at that. I want you to see what that is. I don't want anybody to say anything. I'm going to put it in Nino's hand. You just close your eyes, Nino. I'm going to put this in your hand, and I want you to feel it. Close your hand and feel it. Now, Nino, tell me what that is. It feels like a piece of metal. Well, move your fingers around it and tell me what kind of a metal. What would you use that for? 
I would imagine to open the door. To open the door. <laughs> what do you call a piece of metal that opens the door? A key. This guy's a real ham, and he put him in front of a camera, and I'm telling you, he'll take it away. You guessed it right, Nino. You win one of our cassette tapes. That is a key. All right? Now, what happened there? Let's stop and think what happened. Nino has sensory factors. He can hear, see, smell, taste, and touch. And when your sensory factor touch comes in contact with something, a light message is sent through a nerve passageway in your body. It strikes a group of cells in your brain. Those brain cells are activated, and the picture that's in the cells flash on the screen of the mind. So although Nino was not looking at this, which is a sensory factor, and it'll work that way too, he was touching the key, and that triggered the image on the screen of his mind. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to show something to Nino, and I'm going to ask him what it is. Nino, I would like you to tell me what that is. A pin. A what? A pin. A pin. You think it is? Yes. You don't know what it is, do you? You're guessing now, aren't you? Now, you weren't guessing when you told me what that is. No. But when, you, when I asked you what this little metal object was, you're guessing. Is that correct? Correct. Now, Nino, what you're really saying is, I had cells of recognition when I touched this, but when I look at this, I have no cells of recognition. Now, we're going to build cells of recognition in your brain. I'm going to tell you what this is, and I'm going to do something with it, and as I do that, instantly, in a millisecond, cells will be built in your brain. That, Nino, has a little plunger on it. Now, as I hit that plunger, something's going to come out of here. Do you see that? That is a toothpick, Nino. <laughs> That's what your Aunt Marg gives you when you don't need anything, all right? Now, all right, now that is a toothpick. Now, that's no big deal, and you could miss the whole message here. But you see, Nino didn't know what that is. Do you know what he was saying? I don't have any cells of recognition in my brain. Now, when you go home, Nino, you can tell Rose that you built some brain cells this morning. She can love more of you. All right? You take more of her home. But that's exactly what that is. All right? And we just built some brain cells. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nino. Nino Spazzeri is, without question, one of the greatest real estate sales managers I've ever met. And you know, I told Brian something, and I'm going to tell you something. Whenever you go to do something, make certain that the people you surround yourself with are very successful. Carl Menninger one point in time pointed out that environment is more important than heredity. In other words, the people you find yourself surrounded by are more important to your success, your well-being, than what's built right into your genes at birth. And I suggested Brian go and see Nino. I told Leslie, go see Nino. Go to work for the man and listen to him and do what he tells you. And he'll draw the best out of you. And that's exactly what he's doing. Now, we're going to build some brain cells with respect to the mind. All right? And as we build these brain cells with respect to the mind, we're going to build a picture of our mind right in here. And then as we get that picture in here, we can start making headway and making some of the adjustments that John talked about in the proper use of the program. The points we just covered were simple, but vitally important. And one of the most important points of all was the fact that you and I must have an image of our mind. Without an image, we have confusion. So that's very, very important. Now, I would like to introduce you to someone who I wrote about in Born Rich, Heinz and Donna Dawes. They came to the seminar and their circumstance was doom and gloom. We had bought this house in July of 1975 after being expropriated for the Pickering Airport fiasco north of the city. And almost every evening I would come home and I would be extremely negative, started to take out my frustrations on Donna because the mortgage payments and everything else was more than what we expected. And after you buy a home, you have to buy curtains and things like that. From 7.30, I believe, until 10.30 at night, I would probably say during those three hours my life changed totally. Because from um, an almost decision 
to having to sell this house to three hours later to having a target of having a Cadillac paid for in three weeks, that is a tremendous change. An important point here is that Heinz Dawes had been an insurance agent for 15 years. He had great information. He had heard many motivational speakers, but he was still at the financial point where he was going to have to sell his house. Heinz's problem was confusion. He did not have an image of his mind, and that's what made the difference. Unfortunately, a lot of those, uh, if you want to call them motivational speakers, are geared on a very narrow, specific point. And yes, it may give you an immediate shot of adrenaline, but very quickly wears down because you are not given the understanding of how it works. If I know how something works, as opposed to simply being told blindly as to how to do it, I have a different understanding. So that was the difference? Yes, the, the very easy, understandable way that Bob explains how the mind works, how you control the mind with your thoughts, and how the results are obtained. I got my Cadillac uh, in 22 days after I made that promise to myself. Now I'd like you to come with me, and just the same as we were able to help Heinz and Donna and millions of others, I want to help you. Watch closely, and we will create an image of your mind that you can work with for the rest of this program, for the rest of your life. We were talking about building brain cells and developing an image and placing it in these cells for our mind. So what we will have then are cells of recognition when we think of our mind, rather than drawing a blank or drawing on a picture of the brain, we actually have a workable image that we can start to use. Now, before we do that, let me mention something here about a gentleman I heard speak way back in the early 70s. I was fortunate enough to be on a program in Chicago at a human resource congress with a gentleman named Frank Goebel. Frank Goebel had been an aerospace engineer. He was the president of an aerospace company. And one day he was working on his budget and he realized that 65 cents out of every dollar revenue coming into that company was going back out of the company again to employees for either salaries or benefits. And he suddenly realized he knew virtually nothing about people. Here he was spending 65% of all the revenue on something he knew virtually nothing about. He said, I knew an awful lot about engineering and I knew a fair amount about aerospace, but I knew very little about people. And so he said that he decided he would study some psychology and fortunately for him, he ended up collaborating with Abraham Maslow. Now, Maslow made a break breakthrough, the like of which is maybe only made every few thousand years. He had come to the conclusion that you and I have infinite potential. He's written a paper, he went on, he left aerospace engineering, and he went on to start the Thomas Jefferson Research Center out in Pasadena. In a paper called The Productive Person, Goebel wrote, by nature, you and I are alike. By practice, we get wide apart. There's the difference in our results again. Now he said the difference between the most dissimilar characters, between the real achievers and the non-achievers, for example, seems to arise not so much from nature as from habit, custom, and education. He went on to quote William James, who concluded that we use a very small part of our real potential. And James said that most people live whether physically, intellectually, or morally, in a very restricted circle of our potential being. We make use of a very small portion of our possible consciousness and of our soul's resources in general. Much like the person who out of their entire bodily organism would get into the habit of using and moving only their little finger. I want you to think for a moment, if you had a child and that child was laying perfectly still in its crib, and the only part of its body it was ever able to move was its little finger. I'm quite certain that you would probably beg, you would borrow, and if you had to, you would steal to find out what's wrong with that child. But isn't it strange that a human being can stop growing mentally at a very early age 
and it can be virtually ignored. This is, without question, one of the most important subjects we can go to. I want to refer back to something Napoleon Hill wrote again that caught my attention when I first read the book. He pointed out in here, somewhere in your makeup, there lies sleeping the seed of achievement, which, if aroused and put into action, will carry you to heights such as you may have never hoped to attain. Do you know, as I think of this and as I read it now, I'm doing things today that 27 years ago, if anyone had suggested, I would have thought they were hallucinating. I um, take a look at my paycheck today. It's so completely different than it was when I first started to study this. In fact, the same people that used to pay me $4,000 a year are now paying me $4,000 an hour. And the only thing that's really changed is what's going on inside. Everything was already there. It's just a matter of learning how to use it. Now, he said, just as a master musician may cause the most beautiful strains of music to pour forth from the strings of a violin, so may you arouse the genius which lies asleep in your brain and cause it to drive you upwards towards any goal you may wish to achieve. Now, I'm going to put a couple of marks on the board, and I want you to really think seriously about this. You know, human organizations, as we know them today, are not going to last much longer. And that is because they have been, we have built them on a false premise. These organizations have been built on the premise that you and I are physical beings, and we're really not. We are spiritual beings living in physical bodies. And we've been gifted with something called an intellect. And by learning to use the intellectual factors in our personality, we can tap into the higher side of our own nature and improve anything in our physical world. Don't you know to the average person that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And it may not make a whole lot of sense to you as I just said it. But you're going to find as we go along with this, and as we keep working with this idea, it's going to make an awful lot of sense to you. Now, I have found when we start to study ourselves, there's only two points of reference we can go to. One is science, and the other is theology. There doesn't seem to be anywhere else to go. I have found that there are only six basic religions. Now, I spent quite a bit of time living and working in California. I think there's something like 4,000 religions in California, but everybody starts their own out there because there's tax breaks, you see. So, <laughs> but you're still going to find there's just six basic religions, and they all teach us essentially the same thing. They teach us that we are non-physical beings. They may use a different word, but the concept is the same. Do you know, it's a strange thing. Most people don't even know much about their own religion, and yet they say mine's right and all the rest are wrong, and they don't even know what the others are. I have found that every one of them has the truth in it. We are non-physical beings. See, the truth is something like the center of town. It really doesn't matter which side you approach it from. When you get there, you're in the same place. Now, the other area that we might want to look at is science. Science tells you your energy. As a matter of fact, a DuPont scientist many years ago said that the electrons and the atoms of your body contain a potential energy of more than 11 million kilowatt hours per pound. Do you know that there's enough potential energy locked up in that thing that you're sitting in that we call a body to light up this whole North American continent for nearly a week? And then you'll hear people say, I haven't got any energy. What a ridiculous statement. That's all we are is a mass of energy. Do you know this thing you're living in vibrates? It glows. As a matter of fact, there is an aura of energy around your body. That is the cells leaving your body. Your body changes at the rate of about 50,000 cells per second. And as the as cells leave the body, new ones are created. And do you know you can photograph the energy leaving the body? Semyon Curley, and way back in the uh, early 30s, perfected a form of photography where he could take and photograph mass and the rays of energy coming from the body would penetrate the camera, penetrate the film, and you'd actually catch it on the, on the film. And you'd photograph the density and the color of it. I would imagine you're very familiar with this, are you, Ani? That's right. And you know, as the image in a person's mind changes, the vibration of their body changes, and the density and the color of this energy changes, and changes dramatically. Do you know you've even got a mental faculty where you can start to feel that energy coming from a person, and you can determine the mood they're in very, very quickly. You can virtually read what's going on inside an individual. 
Now, as we study this, we're going to find that this side and this side is actually all hooked up. Think of this for a second. You see sitting here on the lectern a glass of water. Now, let's stop and think about this for a moment. We call that glass. It's actually energy. Because of the speed it's vibrating at, we call it glass. We call this water. That's what it is. It's water. But it's actually energy, too. As a matter of fact, the ring that's hitting it is energy, and the finger that the ring is on is energy. Everything's energy. Everything vibrates at a different speed. But stay with me here for a moment. What we're talking about here is energy. Now, while the energy is in the vibratory rate it's in, in that glass, we're going to call it water. And we call it water because it's vibrating at a physical or a corporeal state. If you were to add heat to that energy that we call water, you wouldn't call it water anymore. Then you would change the terminology that you would use. It would be the same energy, but it would be moving faster in a higher speed of vibration. Then we would call it steamer vapor. And we would call the energy steam or vapor because it's not in a physical vibration. It's now moved into what we call an astral vibration. If we were to continue to add heat to that energy that we now call steam, you wouldn't call it steam any longer. You would call it air, ether, or gas. And that's because it's not in an astral vibration any longer. It's moved into now what we call an etheric vibration. But every level, it's the same energy. Now, as we take a look at this, we're going to let these lines represent levels of vibration, or as we more commonly refer to them as frequencies. And you know, each frequency is hooked up to the one above and the one below. There's no line of demarcation where one stops and the other starts. See, every frequency, it's like the colors of a rainbow. As they fit together, there's no place where one color stops and the other starts. They're all joined together. Now, you're never going to see that with something you call sight. Sight is a physical sensory factor. You have to go to one of your higher faculties and you develop this through understanding. You start to understand. So, do you see, the part of us that we cannot see and the part we can see is all the same. This is just the flip side of the coin of this. Spirit always manifests through its polar opposite. We have the ability right here to tap in to this great power that I choose to refer to as spirit, and we can tap in with an intellect, and we can cause this power to literally move into form into something we call an idea. That idea must literally move into something we refer to as results. You see, both science and theology clearly indicate nothing is created or destroyed. The only thing you can do is cause it to change. Now, this particular program is about prosperity. And when we think of prosperity, money plays a very large role. But of course, so do relationships and so does the health of our body. But let's go back and think about money for a moment. Now, when you think about money, Money is really an idea. You say, that's money. No, money is an idea. It's manifest on paper. Now, paper used to be wood. I remember when I was a little boy, I lived way up in Mishapakotten Harbor. That's about three wigwams this side of the North Pole. It's a little north of King Garden, I think. But at any rate, when I lived up there, I'd watch them take these large logs out on flat cars on the railroad. And I remember people telling me that they were going to make paper out of it. And I thought, how do you make paper out of a tree? It didn't seem to make sense. Well, you alter the vibratory rate of the energy that's called wood, and pretty soon it's called paper. And then you put ink on it, and now we call it money. Now, let's think about this money for a moment. If it can be neither created nor destroyed, it must already be here. If we can't destroy it, if heat will cause the energy that we call water to move into an etheric state, I would imagine heat would cause what we call money to move into an etheric state. And there it goes. Now, where is it? You say it's gone. It's not gone. still here. You see, you'll never see it on the level it's on now 
with your physical sensory factor sight. But if you use your intellect and develop understanding, you'll know that it's still here. What we want to do is cause it to move into form. Now that's just about as bizarre as anything you'll ever hear <laughs> to some people's ears. But I'm going to tell you, it's just as true as anything you'll ever hear if you understand natural laws. And what I'm talking about is moving your mind into a higher vibration, developing a higher consciousness, and you can literally attract all the good that you want. You see, money is literally attracted to us, or it's repelled. Now, in the first 27 years of my life, I can assure you that I was not magnetized to that green energy. <laughs> it used to stay away from me, and now it just keeps coming to me. What did he say in this book? Right in the start of it. He said, when money starts coming, it'll come so fast and sure, so furious, it will literally make your head spin. Now, let's take these simple concepts that have deep meaning, and let's take this other board here and build a picture. One of our intellectual factors is imagination. Another one is reason. Now, with reason, we have the ability to think. John's going to be talking about that a little later on. With our imagination, we can tap into this infinite power and we can build beautiful pictures in our mind. Now, since no one has an image of the mind, we have to make one. It's like the little boy in school. He was sitting there doodling away, drawing a picture, and the teacher says, what are you doing, son? The kid says, I'm drawing a picture of God. The teacher says, nobody's ever seen God. Well, he says, wait till I finish the picture, you know. <laughs> I heard about a gentleman that was running a seminar in Vancouver, British Columbia. I was living and working in Chicago at the time. I, at the time, was prepared to go anywhere to try and find out why I changed. And Vancouver was not too far to go from Chicago. I always sort of laugh when I hear a pe person say, oh, if you hold one, one of these seminars in the east end of the city, I'll come, but I don't want to drive across the city. I'd walk across the continent if I thought I could get something that would help me understand me better because I know it's my understanding of me that's going to determine the results that I get in my life, in my happiness, in my health, or in the area of wealth. Well, I flew off out to Vancouver and I had heard many speakers. I'd read many books. I had a ton of information running around my head, but I couldn't get it to fit. And I couldn't get it to fit for the same reason that some of you have never been able to get it to fit. You have no picture in the brain cells of the mind. Do you know there's many psychiatrists that have problems with their patients because they're not giving them an image to work with when they're working with their mind. I have taught this idea to psychiatrists. I had a psychiatrist, Marty Cohen, out in Century City, California, tell me that he made more headway with a patient in four visits than he had previously made in four years. And the simple reason for it is he gave them order. He gave them a picture to start to work with. Well, as soon as this gentleman got up and started to speak, he was a great big gentleman by comparison to me. He and I looked like Laurel and Hardy when we worked together. But at any rate, the second he got up to speak, I knew this man knew what he was talking about. And I'm going to tell you, I listened carefully. I went over when he was finished and I asked him, I said, could I spend a couple of hours with you? And I'll never forget him looking at his watch and telling me that he was sorry. He didn't have a couple of hours. He had to go and catch a plane. Now he said, I'd love to spend some time with you. But he said, I've got to catch a plane. And I said, well, I've got to catch a plane too. I don't mean right now. And I said, where are you going? Or he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. He said, where do you live? And I said, Chicago. Well, he said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I come out to hear you speak. He said, that's a long way. And I said, not for what I got. And so at any rate, I think he was impressed that I had traveled so far. He got his calendar out and I got mine out. And he told me he was going to be in Toronto in a couple of weeks. And I said, well, Toronto's only an hour from Chicago. It's just up and down. I'll come over if you'll meet with me. Well, the two of us sat down in the Skyline Hotel. And I'm going to tell you, Leland Bell Vandewal taught me as much in two hours. Well, I should say two days. No, it wasn't. It was two hours. We just spent a couple of days together. But everything fell into place in just a couple of hours. He taught me more in two hours than I had learned in nine years, studying faithfully every day. And he proceeded to tell me, he said, listen, Bob, he said, there's a difference between hearing and listening. He said, you hear with your ears, you listen with your emotions. 
Now he said, as you sit here, he said, your mind could take a trip, but your body would stay right in front of me. Now he said, you'd hear every word I'm saying, but he said, you may not necessarily be listening. He said, if you're going to learn, you're going to have to listen. And you listen with your emotions. You've got to keep your mind with your body. No trips. Now I said, if you do that, odds are pretty good you'll learn. And he says, there's a vast difference between learning and gathering information. He said, you see, all the way through school, we were encouraged to read, remember, and repeat. Read, remember, and repeat. And if you were able to do that fairly well, you were given the mortarboard of the sheepskin. And they said you had learned. Doesn't necessarily mean you've learned anything at all. You might have learned how to develop your memory, but that might have been the end of it. Now, I'm not saying no one learns doing that. Some do. But he said learning is not gathering information. Learning is when you consciously entertain an idea, you get emotionally involved in the idea, you step out and act on the idea, and you improve the results in some area of your life. Now, he said, this is the name of the game, Bob. He says it's results. Pretty good teacher a long time ago said, by their fruits, you'll know them. In other words, you can always tell a person's level of awareness by the results they're getting. If the results aren't there, they have no one to blame but themselves. For 27 years, I blamed everybody. I blamed my parents. I blamed my brother, my sister. I blamed my employers. I blamed the commanding officers I had in the Navy. It was never me, always them. They weren't doing enough for me. They weren't doing it right. The truth was, I wasn't facing up to the truth about me. I was never studying. I didn't know anything about myself. And as a result, the results indicated it. I was unhappy, sick, and broke. Now, he said, Bob, he said, you're going to have to alter some ideas in your mind. But he said, to do that, you're going to have to have a picture to work with. And he told me about a doctor in San Antonio, Texas, Dr. Thruman Fleet. He started the concept therapy movement. He said he attempted to teach the healing arts, and he ran into a problem. He said the medical profession that he was a part of were treating symptoms or effects. They were not treating causes. And he said, if you're ever going to enjoy health, you must treat the whole person. Now that's called holistic healing. How many of you are familiar with holistic healing? Quite a few. Well, that's where you heal the whole person. You see, you're a triune being. You live simultaneously on three planes of understanding. Every one of us are the same. Every one of us. The difference is in our results, but the same here. And that's where it all starts. And that's what we want to understand. When we walk into that office where the broad loom is up to our cheeks and there's a great big oak desk and a battery of secretaries, that person is not that much better than you are. I don't care how big their car is, how much money they've got in the bank. I don't care how pretty they are. They're no better than you and they're no better than me. See, our problem is we have been living strictly with our sensory factors and never with our higher level of understanding. If a person's skin is a different color, we say they're different. If a person lives on the other side of an imaginary line, we say they're different. If a person speaks a different language, we say they're different. If a person is a different sex, we say they're different. Are they? No. They appear different to our sight. But when we develop a higher understanding, we're going to find out that we're all the same. And when we start to grasp that, then we can start to take action on the results we want. As we see a person getting better results, we can watch and see how they're getting them, and then we can do what, we're, what they're doing. Napoleon Hill says it pays to know how to buy knowledge. I'm going to tell you the best money you have ever invested is in this seminar. And I'm not saying that because I'm selling it or I'm doing it. And I'm not saying that because John's selling it or John's doing it. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that because I've studied thousands of seminars, and what we've done is take the very best out of them all and put them in this. When this was introduced to you early this morning, this was advertised as the most effective personal development seminar in the world today. It is, so far as I know. And I'm going to tell you, I've been to a lot of them. And it is because we give you a picture and then we show you how to change things. Well, Dr. Fleet said, if we're going to see health, we're going to have to give a person an image of the other side of their personality. And he said, since no one's ever seen the mind, I'm going to make a picture of the mind. Now, he said, let this represent the mind. Then he said, let this represent the thing that we've given all of our attention to now, up till now, the body. And he says, it's this thing here that moves into action and causes the results that we get. If we're going to change 
what we do, or if we're going to change our behavior, we're definitely going to have to change what's going on in here. If we're going to change what's going on in here, we're going to have to understand how it functions. And as he pointed out, there are two <coughs> sections to the mind, joined together, but different in their method of operation. And he referred to this as the conscious mind, and this as the subconscious mind. Now, if you look on page six of your action planner, you'll see that drawing. The day Leland Bell van der Waal drew that on the opposite side of a placemat in the coffee shop of the Skyline Hotel on Dixon Road in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, I'm going to tell you my life changed. I've put that drawing on the board thousands and thousands of times, and periodically when I do, I hear people snicker. But I'm going to tell you, if they stick around, they don't snicker for long. Because what it does, it starts to trigger all kinds of light in their mind. You've heard, let there be light, let there be a higher consciousness, let there be an awareness. Well, what we've given you here is a picture to start working with. It's not my picture. It's not even Truman Fleet's. It's our picture. The second you've got it in your mind, it's yours. No one can lay claim to something like this, but we can all use it. And we are all the same. I don't care how different you may appear to be to the person beside you, you and the person beside you are exactly the same. Now, it's understanding of how this functions that makes it different. Now, if you'll flip over in your exercise book, your action planner to page eight. And I would suggest that you follow this really closely. You could be sitting in your den or your family room and just watching this and the book stuck away somewhere. That'd be a terrible error. You'd be wasting your time. And you know, Time wasted, you never get back. Now, of course, you only have to pay once, you see. If you've wasted the past, you've already paid the price. You don't have to pay twice. There's one some consolation to it. But I would suggest you get the book out and follow me here. Now, you'll notice on page eight and nine are six drawings there. It's actually just three different ideas, or it's one idea broken down into three different parts. And as you take a look on page eight, the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, and the body, there are some very key parts to that. On the top drawing on page eight, we say this is the part of your mind that thinks or reasons. This is where your free will lies. Viktor Frankl wrote a magnificent book called Man's Search for Meaning. Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychiatrist who spent the war years in a German concentration camp. And you know, I don't suppose anyone has ever been subjected to more abuse, intellectually and physically, than someone in one of those camps. I certainly couldn't even imagine it, even although he wrote it very well. But he pointed out, he said, regardless of how they chained us and abused us, they could never take control of our mind unless we chose to let them. He did not choose to let them. Viktor Frankl was a courageous man. He's lived to talk about it. He's lived to teach about it. And I'm going to tell you, he's a wise person. That's where your free will lies. You don't have to follow anybody else. We say the conscious mind can accept or reject any idea. Now, there is no person or circumstance that can cause you to think thoughts or ideas you do not choose. They are the most important lines that you might find in this entire program. Now, what I'm going to do is run over a few ideas. And as I do with each part, on page nine, jot some of them down. Not what I say, but what it means to you. Now, let's understand this right away. What I say, or what John says in this seminar, is not that important. What you see us put on the board is not that important. The different little props that we may use, they're not that important. What's important is what you think as a result of something we may say, or you may see on the board. That's what's important. There's something you want, and there might be one idea that we fire out that'll just trigger something in your mind, and away you go. And you can do anything you want. I was talking to Raymond Aaron here earlier this morning. He's got a millionaire's club, and there's many of you in the audience, and I want to congratulate you. I think it's a great idea. He's teaching people how to become millionaires. I watch a lot of people laugh when they say, what? He's already made a hundred, a hundred people. Have, have developed a net worth of at least a million dollars just through one person's teaching. It's incredible, isn't it? 
It really is. That's not a crazy idea at all. You want to be a millionaire? You can be a millionaire. If you want to start your own business, you can start your own business. You can do anything you want. But clearly understand this. If you don't know how this works, you haven't got a snowball's chance in that hot place of doing it. We're just about to the end of this first tape. There's been some very important material covered. It's vitally important that you go back and you read through this book. Possibly even watch the entire tape again before going on to the next tape. Read from page 5 to page 8. Cover your own notes and pay particular attention to page 8 before you go to the second tape. Please understand this. This program will be of little value if you have not established a goal, something you really want, that you're emotionally involved in, that you're working towards. Possibly to help you, before we go to the second tape, we'll take you on a little tour down through some tropical island.